This is Andrea Peters with the World Socialist website. On today's program, we are going to be discussing the 75th anniversary of the assassination of Leon Trotsky, one of the great political crimes of the 20th century. Trotsky, alongside Lenin, led the Russian Revolution of 1917. In the civil war that erupted in the aftermath of that revolution, Trotsky commanded the Red Army, securing the victory of the first ever worker's state against an onslaught of invading forces. In the 1920s, Trotsky led the left opposition, which opposed the rise to power of Joseph Stalin and the bureaucracy he represented. At the end of 1927, however, Trotsky was expelled from the Communist Party. In January 1929, he was exiled from the Soviet Union. Over the course of the next decade, Trotsky waged an intense struggle against the counter-revolutionary policies of Stalin's regime, which was carrying out a campaign of mass murder inside the USSR aimed at wiping out the country's entire socialist heritage. While in exile and forced to move from country to country, Trotsky wrote his autobiography, My Life, his historical masterpiece, History of the Russian Revolution, and his seminal critique of Stalinism, The Revolution Betrayed. After 1933, Trotsky devoted himself to the building of a new Fourth International. In August of 1940, an agent of Stalin's secret police killed Trotsky at his home in Coyacan, Mexico. Trotsky had lived there since 1937, having won political asylum from the Mexican government with the help and intervention of the famous Mexican muralist, Diego Rivera. Our guest today is David North, chairman of the International Editorial Board of the World Socialist website. David has been active in the Marxist and Trotskyist movement for 45 years. He has written extensively on Trotsky's political and theoretical legacy and his contemporary significance. Some of his more recent titles include the books In Defense of Leon Trotsky, The Russian Revolution and the Unfinished 20th Century, and The Frankfurt School, Postmodernism, and the Politics of the Pseudo-Left. From the mid-1970s to the early 80s, David played a major role in an investigation carried out by the International Committee of the Fourth International into the circumstances surrounding Trotsky's murder. That investigation, known as Security and the Fourth International, will be a central theme of this two-part interview series. David, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'd like to begin by talking about the reasons for the assassination itself. Why did Stalin want Trotsky dead? Well, to uh, answer the question why uh, Stalin wanted Trotsky dead, you have to place uh, the assassination in the context of the entire history of the Russian Revolution and the history of the 20th century. By the time Trotsky was murdered in 1940, he had come to embody and in fact uh, represented as no other person the legacy of the Russian Revolution, the perspective of world socialist revolution. And he was seen as a threat despite the fact that he lived in exile. He was seen as a threat not only by Stalin, but by all the imperialist governments, whether democratic or fascist. It's interesting to note when one reads accounts of the events of the 1930s and the great events of those years, years of immense world crisis, one often will notice beneath the headlines in which the events are reported, there'll be a one-column article citing Trotsky's response to these events. Trotsky was never looked upon as an individual. He was looked upon in some respects as a, a revolutionary government in exile, the spokesman of the re revolutionary movement of the working class, of the perspective which endured of the October Revolution. Now, in relation to Stalin, I know it's very common uh, in many books which appear, there have been many biographies, both of Stalin and of Trotsky. Generally, the biographies of Stalin which appear and which are put out by bourgeois academics are far more sympathetic to Stalin, while those which appear about Trotsky are almost universally hostile. But it's often said that Trotsky's uh, efforts were hopeless. He uh, was marginalized, he was isolated, he represented no threat to uh, Stalin. That was ever the way Stalin saw things. And in this particular case, Stalin's understanding uh, was far more accurate and profound than 
contemporary professors. One must keep in mind that Stalin, uh, Trotsky would refer to Stalin at, at times as a former revolutionist, as a man who had gone through the experience of the October Revolution. Stalin understood the danger posed by a revolutionary movement. After all, in the beginning of 1917, Lenin was in exile in Switzerland. Trotsky was in exile in New York. And Stalin himself was in Siberia. And yet, the upheavals which erupted in February 1917 in Petrograd marked the beginning of a revolutionary movement which by the end of that year had placed the Bolshevik party in power. Uh, from the standpoint of Stalin, Trotsky represented his great and most implacable opponent. He represented the revolutionary tradition. He understood that despite all the repression that had been directed against Trotsky, the Fourth International, his supporters, uh, Trotsky retained within the Soviet Union an immense potential reservoir of support. <coughs> And he also understood that under conditions of war and the crisis which war would bring about, the possibility existed that uh, the, there would be a renewal of a revolutionary movement of the working class. And in those conditions, Trotsky alive uh, could be returned to the Soviet Union and uh, take the leadership of a revolu revolutionary movement. In fact, this very point was made uh, by Victor Serge in uh, his uh, book on Russia 20 years after the revolution. He says there remains one head of the revolution and the greatest head of that, it's, it's that of Trotsky. He said, thumbs a shock, comes a war. Uh, the working class will turn to Trotsky. And Trotsky's assassination was the culmination of Stalin's efforts to remove his greatest opponent. He understood the threat that Trotsky represented. So let's explore this theme a little bit more. Um, you're arguing that there were fundamental political differences between Stalin and Trotsky, and Stalin always foresaw the possibility that even though he had, in a sense, beaten back the Trotskyists inside the Soviet Union, that that situation could reverse itself. Yes, I mean, the, <coughs> the, the struggle between Trotsky and, and Stalin was not a struggle of personalities. It was a clash of completely opposed programs. Uh, Stalin represented a nationalist and counter-revolutionary reaction against the world revolutionary perspectives that underlay the October Revolution. Those who made the revolution understood that the October Revolution was so to speak, the first shot of a world revolution, that the fate of that revolution depended upon its extension into Europe, throughout Asia, into the United States, above all, the advanced capitalist countries. And the uh, underlying programmatic issues upon which the struggle between Stalin and Trotsky arose was precisely this. Uh, Stalin advanced the program of socialism in one country, which was essentially a, a nationalist repudiation of the perspective of world socialism. Trotsky uh, represented, uh, particularly in the elaboration of the theory of permanent revolution, that October, the October Revolution could only be secured through the extension of the revolution internationally. All the divisions, all the subs, every other issue flowed essentially from that fundamental question. Uh, as this struggle evolved, the nationalist program became more and more the foundation upon which a bureaucracy sought to utilize the October Revolution in its own interests. The October Revolution state property which it established became a mechanism for securing privilege for a bureaucratic elite. And increasingly, uh, the bureaucracy came to be aware and understood that the defense of its privileges within the Soviet Union uh, required the suppression not only of the movement of the working class within Russia, but the uh, destruction of the international revolutionary movement. For the Stalinists, the movement of the working class internationally was to be subordinated 
uh, to the interests, the nationally defined interests of the Soviet bureaucracy. So the 1930s was also the period of the great betrayals of working class revolution in Germany, in France, most tragically in Spain, and all of these defeats ultimately led uh, to the outbreak of World War II. Could you maybe elaborate a little bit more um, on a particular area in which Trotsky opposed Stalin and his policies with regards to this question of uh, nationalism versus internationalism, perhaps talking about, I don't know, events in Germany or Spain? Could you elaborate more on that? Well, every aspect of Trotsky's policy was embedded in a conception of the international character of the socialist movement. For Trotsky, the question of socialism arose not out of a specific national crisis of one or another country. Trotsky, like Lenin, <coughs> had uh, explained particularly in the aftermath of the outbreak of World War I that the question of socialism had become fundamentally an international question. Trotsky said most famously, and this was in his critique of the draft program of the Communist International, which he wrote after he was exiled in 1928. That was his critique, which he prepared in preparation for the gathering of the International in uh, June or July of 1928. And he subjected the Stalinist program, which actually had been written by Bukharin, uh, to a very uh, intense critique. He said, August 4th, 1914, that is the day of the social democratic betrayal of the working class and the support given by the German Social Democrats to the war credits, actually the very beginning of World War I. He said August 4th, 1914 marked the death knell of all national programs. And the strategy of the working class in any given country has to proceed from an understanding of the international contradictions of the capitalist system. That is to say that the, one of the essential driving forces of the social revolution was the conflict between the growth of world economy, the global character of the capitalist system, and the nation state system within which capitalist economics and bourgeois rule is embedded. In fact, he pointed out that imperialism was the manner in which the bourgeoisie itself sought to overcome through reactionary measures this essential contradiction between world economy and national state. So the program of the working class had to be based on an international strategy. The whole theory of socialism in one country was a reversion to a, a nationalist perspective that the uh, Soviet Union could create on the basis of economic autarky, economic nationalism, some sort of socialist society. That was absolutely impossible. And many of the economic disasters uh, which uh, afflicted the Soviet Union the late 20s, even in the 1930s, and of course beyond all the way up to its dissolution in 1991, uh, flowed from the essentially impossible effort to uh, construct a planned socialist economy within a national framework. Now the point which must be made and how this then ultimately expresses itself in international politics. <clears throat> more and more openly, the policies pursued by Stalin internationally, consciously and deliberately subordinated the revolutionary struggle to the nationalist objectives of the bureaucracy. That is, for the Soviet bureaucracy, for Stalin, over time the Communist International itself, the Communist parties, became mechanisms he employed to bring pressure upon various imperialist countries in pursuit of Soviet foreign policy objectives. And this acquired an ever more openly and consciously counter-revolutionary character, uh, particularly after the defeat of the working class in Germany, the coming to power of the fascist regime under Hitler. Uh, at that point, Stalin uh, very deliberately employs the politics of popular frontism in order to uh, subordinate the working class to liberal bourgeois democratic regimes in the belief that uh, 
pressure can be brought uh, for an alliance with the Soviet Union. That leads to disaster. It's on that basis, of course, that the Spanish Civil War uh, was betrayed by the Stalinists. Stalin absolutely opposed a social revolution in Spain. And it should be noted that out of the counter-revolutionary crimes committed by Stalin, that itself played a major role in the preparation of the assassination of Trotsky. Following the defeat of the Spanish working class, then Stalin shifts course and he concludes his alliance with Hitler. So on every question, the, the divisions were so profound and uh, perhaps it's difficult for those who are not aware of this history or when, as these experiences recede to uh, grasp the extent to which Stalinism uh, played such a devastating counter-revolutionary role. I recall during the investigation into security in the Fourth International, I had the occasion to meet many old Trotskyists, some of whom had been active in Spain, and uh, one of them, Harry Milton, uh, said to me, you, 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 you had to be there. Anyone who went to Spain and smelled the stink of Stalinist revolution could never get it out of his nostrils. That's what it was. It was, you know, was counter-revolution. It was the destruction of revolutionaries, the subordination of the working class to the uh, criminal uh, policies of the Soviet bureaucracy. Um, you're talking about the counter-revolutionary character of Stalinism, and uh, I'd like to ask you a question um, about that. In the introduction to the book, How the GPU Murdered Trotsky, which was a product of this investigation, Security in the Fourth International, it's noted, and this is a quote, world imperialism was not at all indifferent to the outcome of the struggle between Trotsky and Stalin. It unerringly identified Stalin as the representative of a conservative tendency within the USSR. In Trotsky and the left opposition, it recognized an implacable enemy. One leading British Tory publicly called upon Stalin to place Trotsky and other left opposition leaders in front of firing squads. Could you talk, uh, could you comment more about this? I mean, is the implication of this statement that the major capitalist powers politically supported Stalin in his effort to exterminate Trotsky? Oh, yes. By the way, the uh, quote you referred to, the British Tory, was Churchill. Churchill uh, uh, wrote a book uh, in 1937. The name of the book escapes me, but it was a, a series of biographical vignettes of, I think it was called Great Contemporaries. Uh, and uh, in that book, he had a great praise for Hitler, great praise for Mussolini, and he has a chapter on Trotsky, which is venomous in its hatred. Uh, Trotsky, of course, represented everything Churchill, the Tory aristocrat, uh, hated and feared. But Trotsky, I think, said it best himself. He, in his autobiography, there's a chapter toward the end, which is entitled, Planet Without a Visa. After he was expelled from the Soviet Union, he attempted to gain admission to uh, Germany. Uh, that was rejected. Of course, England would not accept him. They did not ex recognize any longer the right uh, uh, to asylum. Trotsky was finally admitted into Turkey, and there produced, by the way, some of his greatest works, uh, the history of the Russian Revolution, his autobiography, his astonishingly prescient articles, uh, warning of the danger represented by uh, Hitler and fascism. And even a historian who was not sympathetic to Trotsky, E.H. Uh, e. Carr, uh, in a book on the 1930s, uh, included an appendix in which he said that uh, no book on this period would be adequate if it didn't include some notation, some recognition of the brilliance of Trotsky's writings on Germany. They were so extraordinary. Trotsky was immensely feared, uh, just as Stalin feared the revolutionary potential of Trotsky in the Soviet Union. Uh, all the bourgeois governments, whether fascist or democratic, uh, feared Trotsky. After he, uh, he finally was able to secure uh, in 1933 uh, admission into France. Uh, 
I believe by the Daladier government. He, he lived under very difficult conditions, under constant supervision. Uh, the French government ultimately wanted him out as soon as possible, and from France he went to Norway. Democratic Norway, Norway with a social democratic government. Uh, some of those social democrats had even attended uh, sessions of the Communist International in the early 1920s. But when the Moscow trials broke out in August 1936, the Norwegian government interned Trotsky, placed him under house arrest in virtually solitary confinement. It toyed with the prospect of actually returning Trotsky uh, to the Soviet Union. Uh, he could not speak to his secretaries. They did everything possible to silence him. And one must imagine or recall that at the very point when the Moscow trials were taking place, and the most staggering lies were being told against Trotsky, the Norwegian government did everything it could to prevent him from answering these lies. There's a uh, famous account of Trotsky's meeting with uh, Trig Vili, one of the leading figures in the Norwegian Social Democratic government. He later became, uh, I think, the first general secretary of the United Nations. And Trig Vili, uh, who despised Trotsky as a social democrat and uh, reformist, uh, he had an encounter with Trotsky, and Trotsky, uh, of course, vehemently protested against the conditions he was being subjected to. And one of the uh, Trig Vili wanted Trotsky to sign a statement saying that, uh, as a condition of remaining in Norway, he would no longer write any material relating to political questions. He had to refrain from all political self-expression. Trotsky refused, and uh, at one point uh, he uh, said to Trig Vili, well, I see that you now very much regret uh, your decision to admit me into Norway, and now you intend to rectify that mistake with a crime. And the only thing that Trivoli said in response is, well, times have changed. At any rate, the de response of Norway very much was an indication of the attitude held toward Trotsky by all bourgeois democratic regimes. One should also add, uh, by the way, that the Roosevelt administration, of course, would not admit Trotsky to the United States. And even after Trotsky was murdered, they would not allow his body to be brought uh, to the United States for burial and memorial meetings. Let's uh, talk now a little bit about contemporary views on Trotsky. Um, you mentioned, for instance, just as you were speaking now, that E.H. Carr, who didn't agree politically at all with Trotsky, had admiration for him. Um, and certainly, uh, if he was, as you explain, at such a feared figure, there must have been an enormous amount of respect or recognition of his uh, influence. But today, um, it increasingly appears that Trotsky is a, an object of attack and, and even sort of hatred in academic and scholarly work. You, you wrote a book on this entitled In Defense of Leon Trotsky. I want to read a quote from Robert Service, who stated in 2009 in the context of a, of a discussion about a book he had just written on Trotsky, explaining why he'd, he'd written this work. He says, there's life in the old boy Trotsky yet, but if the ice pick didn't quite do its job killing him off, I hope I've managed it. So why would someone, uh, a scholar and expert as services in Russian and Soviet history, want so much today to attempt to uh, assassinate him again, you could say? Well, I would uh, dispute the description of service as either a scholar, let alone an expert on Soviet history. He's neither. Uh, well, that's what he's presented as. <coughs> Uh, his book is one of a whole series of books which appeared over the past decade or so dedicated to discrediting Trotsky. But th and of course, uh, in his ambition to finish Trotsky off, he totally failed. His, he finished his, whatever remained of his reputation, I believe, was finished off by his book. And to the extent that uh, my book contributed to that, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased. But the uh, more basic point is that and it goes to the, the place of Trotsky in history. 
in the history of the 20th century. As one gains more distance, and now we're discussing Trotsky's assassination 75 years after the event, one might have thought that after so many years, if Trotsky were any sort of conventional political figure, even a perhaps a revolutionary figure, that with 75 years it would be time for historians to settle down and approach his life objectively, to make an evaluation, whatever the historian's individual political outlook may be, not that that totally goes away, but at least can make judgments based on an honest and accurate assessment of historical facts as they are made available through the release of archives and so on. That's not possible with Trotsky. Uh, Trotsky retains a contemporary character which is quite extraordinary and I think that it can only be explained by the fact that Trotsky's writings were bound up with an analysis of a set of political conditions on a world scale which today resonate, they resemble our own. Uh, Trotsky lived until 1940, he passed through the experience of Stalinism, the beginning of the Second World War, the revolution and counter-revolution of the 1930s, the beginning of the great national revolutionary struggles, the emergence of a massive movement of the working class, particularly in the United States. He addressed political questions which remain extraordinarily relevant to our period, and particularly with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, an event which he foresaw. The question inevitably arose, was the collapse of the Soviet Union inevitable? Was there an alternative? And to speak of an alternative to Stalinism, to the dissolution of the Soviet Union, immediately raises the question of Trotsky. So it is quite understandable for those who wanted to argue whether the end of history, the end of socialism, uh, the past is over, Trotsky's writings are all too powerful a refutation. You cannot, from an intellectual standpoint, credibly make that argument as long as it can be demonstrated that there was somebody else who actually foresaw to an extraordinary degree of accuracy what would happen in the USSR. I mean, even after 80 years, and next year will mark the 80th anniversary of the publication of Revolution Betrayed, there is no other book which so brilliantly analyzed the Soviet Union and in discussing the possible fate of the revolution described so explicitly or anticipated so explicitly what actually happened after 1991. That is the dissolution by the bureaucracy itself of the Soviet Union and the restoration of capitalism. So Trotsky is an extraordinarily contemporary figure. I think I note in book in defense of Leon Trotsky that discussions of Trotsky are never just about the past, they're about the present, and they're also about the future. The moment one speaks about Trotsky and indicates an attitude toward Trotsky, one is indicating an attitude toward contemporary politics and how one foresees the future. So Trotsky, in a way that is unequaled by any other historical figure of, let us say, the first half of the 20th century, remains a man whose example and whose writings are astonishingly relevant to the period in which we live. How so? I mean, uh, can you give a concrete example of what you're talking about in relationship, I don't know, to maybe the refugee crisis in Europe, to the disintegration, the violence in the Middle East. I mean, we have even today in the United States a conflict erupting between auto workers on the one hand and uh, the major auto companies and the union, the UAW on the other hand. So how is Trotsky's work relevant to these contemporary problems facing masses of people? Well, I would say, first of all, if one speaks about Trotsky, the most central element to return to another point Trotsky is a theoretician of world socialist revolution. He's a theoretician of world history. He understands questions within an international framework. He understands that the central driving force of global politics is the collision 
uh, of revolutionary politics is the collision between uh, a globalized economy and the persistence of the nation state system. That is Trotsky's essential f theoretical framework. It remains the essential theoretical framework for any understanding of politics today in any country. So if one wishes to talk intelligently about anything in, in politics, whether it's events in the Middle East, uh, the crisis in Europe, uh, the declining decline of the United States, and yes, I might make the point no one understood more clearly than Trotsky, the significance of American capitalism. As early as 1930, he described American imperialism as the basic counter-revolutionary force in the world. He warned that the world would witness a colossal eruption, a volcanic eruption, he said, of American imperialism. Uh, in <laughs> It w once replying to, uh, referring to the United States, uh, he said, America is always claiming to liberate somebody. He understood American, the reality of American capitalism. He understood the revolutionary potential of the American working class. But since you mentioned just this question of, uh, and to be fair to our listeners, you'd, you did give me an advance notice that you would ask me something about contemporary events. So I was, uh, and you mentioned the question of the refugee crisis. I just want to read a brief passage uh, from Trotsky's manifesto, the last great manifesto he wrote in February 1940, after the Second World War had begun, and he's talking about the refugees. He said, the world of decaying capitalism is overcrowded. The question of admitting a hundred extra refugees becomes a major problem for such a world power as the United States. In an era of aviation, telegraph, telephone, radio, and television, travel from country to country is paralyzed by passports and visas. The period of the wasting away of foreign trade and the decline of domestic trade is at the same time the period of the monstrous intensification of chauvinism and especially of anti-Semitism. In the epoch of its rise, capitalism took the Jewish people out of the ghetto and utilized them as an instrument in its commercial expansion. Today, Decaying capitalist society is striving to squeeze the Jewish people from all its pores, 17 million individuals out of 2 billion populating the globe, that is less than 1%, can no longer find a place on our planet. Now consider those words. Trotsky talks about anti-Semitism and contemporary discussions in the United States about erecting borders uh, between the United States and Mexico, or the uh, criminal animosity of the European ruling elites to the refugees from the Middle East, refugees who have been placed in a desperate situation by the wars launched by the United States uh, with the support of European capitalism. So of course Trotsky's writings here are so immensely relevant, one doesn't have to change very many words in order to have an almost uh, precise description of conditions we face today. We're speaking this afternoon with David North, chairman of the International Editorial Board of the World Socialist website. We're talking about the 75th anniversary of Trotsky's assassination. We have listeners joining us from around the world. I'd like to encourage everybody who's participating to um, leave questions. We'll be asking David questions from our listening audience. Also, the World Socialist website is supported entirely through donations. We urge you to make a contribution today, which you can do on the web page through which you're listening to this interview. In addition, you can purchase um, titles by David North at uh, the website maring.com. Uh, they are published by Maring Books. Um, I'd like to shift now to a listener question that we have. Um, one uh, listener asks, how do we raise the consciousness of workers with the work of Trotsky without creating an icon of Trotsky? Well, icons are sort of graven images. I mean, we're not talking about graven images. We're talking about written words, programs, which can be examined and studied. Uh, Trotsky is, is not an icon. He was not a god. He was a major and one of certainly the greatest figures in the history of international socialism. Uh, our attitude toward Trotsky uh, is political and historically informed. Uh, it is the case, as I've said, that his writings retain 
an enormous relevance. They are a guide. They are not and they cannot be the last word on every political question. Of course, all writings are a product of a certain time and a certain period, and uh, his works have to be approached uh, critically. But when we uh, discuss Trotsky's place in history, it's bound up with, as I've said before, events which resonate in our own time, which still have a profound impact on the politics of our day. Trotsky is a basic reference point in understanding the world in which we live. And so if we're going to discuss the world after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, it's important to understand why the Soviet Union was dissolved. How can one talk about socialism in the 21st century if one doesn't understand the tragedy of socialism in the 20th century? I mean, the, the working class is being politically radicalized now. There are many signs of that. And uh, certainly there is a renewal of interest in socialism. But there'll be great confusion about socialism, what it is. Is it possible? And no struggle for socialism can be carried forward without being able to answer concretely and clearly the questions which arise about the Russian Revolution, the most significant political event of the 20th century. This actually takes us back to a question that another listener has posed. It's more of a historical question. Um, the listener asks, would you explain how it came about that the Trotsky-led faction of the Bolsheviks were defeated and eventually annihilated by the Stalin faction? This is somewhat perplexing, since Trotsky had immense admiration and prestige, while Stalin, I think, had been viewed as something of a non-entity. I assume there must be more to it than their personal characteristics, Trotsky's decency and humanism as opposed to Stalin's utter ruthlessness? Well, I think it's <coughs> worthwhile to recall how Trotsky himself <coughs> asked the, uh, answered this question. <coughs> he said that very often, <coughs> excuse me, he would be asked, uh, how did you lose power? And he said there was a tendency to, uh, <coughs> excuse me for a moment, he said there was a tendency to look at the question of power, a losing power like someone loses a watch. He said that the, uh, his loss of power was bound up with objective conditions. One might, to answer the question why he lost power, one might ask the antecedent question, why did he gain power? How was it possible that a man who was living in exile in New York City in January was living in the Kremlin 12 months later and the leader of the Red Army. What happened was the eruption of revolution, a monumental upsurge of the class struggle, a vast change in social relationships which profoundly altered the balance of forces between the revolutionary tendency, which was the most conscious expression of that process, and all other political, reformist political tendencies, bourgeois political tendencies. Within the Soviet Union itself, Trotsky's decline was bound up most fundamentally with the defeat suffered by the working class uh, in the aftermath of the Russian Revolution, particularly in Germany. Uh, there had been an expectation that the Russian Revolution would be followed by a revolution in Germany. Now that uh, expectation was not groundless. In fact, there was in 1919, in 1921, and again, finally, in 1923, a significant revolutionary upsurge. The problem was uh, the problem of leadership, the absence of the type of leadership that had existed in the form of the Bolshevik party, and these revolutions were defeated, and the revolution was isolated, and it was that which created, you might say, a change in political mood which favored the strengthening of more conservative factions within the Bolshevik party. That is, those who were saying, look, we tried world revolution, we tried international revolution, that hasn't worked. What about socialism in one country? I mean, that was, <clears throat> there was a shift in political mood and that underlay uh, Trotsky's loss of power. He explains this brilliantly in his autobiography. Uh, I'm not saying that this was uh, 
absolutely predetermined. Such events as Lenin's death was a major factor in the weakening of the revolutionary tendency. Uh, it was certainly uh, a factor in Trotsky's isolation within the Bolshevik party. But in the final analysis, to understand the fate of Trotsky, the fate of the revolutionary tendency, requires that we look at objective conditions and focus on that. Uh, it was the defeats of the working class which isolated the revolutionary tendency. And uh, the paradox of history was the more Stalin's policies led to defeats, the more his own faction was strengthened. So uh, I have one more historical question for you, and then I'd actually like to turn our discussion to the assassination itself. During the 20s, as Trotsky was lack, uh, locked in this battle with Stalin and the bureaucracy, he actually devoted a great deal of his time to writing on cultural and artistic questions. And I know that some of his biographers um, were critical of his preoccupation with those issues at that time. Uh, what do you make of it? Why was Trotsky so concerned with these sorts of questions at this period of, of an immense, colossal political struggle with a very dangerous enemy? Well, because I think Trotsky saw the question of culture within the framework of the struggle for raising the consciousness of the working class. Uh, I think one of the basic problems which one encounters when one reads the accounts, even of uh, conscientious historians, and I'm thinking of historians who wrote in an earlier period, there are very few of them today. There are some, and I would like to urge our readers to familiarize themselves with the works, for example, of Alexander Rabinovich, who is the dean of an old school of historians, which he still represents, his wonderful books on the Bolshevik Revolution and its aftermath. But one thing which is very, very hard for historians to understand, particularly those who have no experience in the workers' movement, is that they approach politics in a very pragmatic way. Uh, they see the struggle of Trotsky and Stalin from the standpoint that, uh, well, Stalin was a great politician because he outmaneuvered Trotsky. One has to keep in mind the very different aims of Trotsky and Stalin. Stalin was as Trotsky often said, an empiricist. He had, if I can, this might sound contradictory, but Stalin's particular strength in the factional struggle against Trotsky is that he foresaw very little. He rarely understood the deeper implications of his own policies, where they were leading him, where they were leading the Soviet Union. Trotsky, again to speak paradoxically, had the disadvantage of understanding precisely the implications of policies, of actions taken by a party. Let me just give an example. One of the questions which often is raised uh, about Trotsky is, well, why didn't Trotsky take advantage of his position as the head of the Red Army and use the Red Army to defeat the bureaucracy, defeat Stalin. Couldn't he have done that in 1923 or 1924? Well, for Trotsky, as a Marxist, that would have meant mobilizing the peasantry, mobilizing the middle class against the working class party. And he would have then been trapped by the logic of such actions. And indeed, had he done that, Trotsky's place in history would be very different. Even if he would have succeeded, he would have been transformed into a very different type of political figure. He would have been the leader of what was essentially a, a, a peasant uprising against the Bolshevik party. He would have lost control himself of that process. He would have had a logic dictated by the social forces unleashed in such a struggle. It would have been mobilizing the peasantry against the working class. Trotsky was aware of these things. When Stalin there's a, uh, a letter, for example, that Stalin wrote to Molotov in 1925 during the factional struggle against the left opposition. And he mocks Trotsky for raising issues relating to the Soviet economy. As far as Stalin could see in 
The Soviet economy was going very well, so why was Trotsky raising all, such a hue and cry and fuss about the new economic policy? And he says the opposition gets zero points on economics. Well, within a very short period of time, the economic situation, as Trotsky foresaw, deteriorated drastically, and Stalin was then forced to adapt himself to a situation he had not foreseen. He took another series of empirical steps, which culminated in the catastrophe of collectivization. So when we, uh, in, in comparing Trotsky and Stalin, one has to be aware that Trotsky based his politics on an understanding of the questions of the long-term development of the working class. And to come back to the question, sorry for getting right around the point, but to come back to the question of culture, Trotsky, for Trotsky, the central question in terms of revolution was raising the consciousness of the working class. The, there was no other means of establishing or developing socialism without the development of revolutionary socialist consciousness the working class, the problem of education, overcoming the backwardness of Russian life. Uh, all of these were, for him, central to the development of the political consciousness of the working class. Of course, one last point about this. There's an article which Trotsky wrote in his book of essays, Problems of Everyday Life, in which he refers to the, which is called the struggle for cultured speech. Now the uh, anti-Trotskyist uh, uh, Ian Thatcher, call him a pseudo-historian, a, a professional anti-Trotskyist, mocks Trotsky and mocks Trotsky's concerns for such questions. But in fact, Trotsky in this article is hearkening back to a tradition which had been very powerful in the Russian workers' movement, in the Russian socialist movement, you know, with the struggle against the terrible cursing, which was a degrading element of the life of the masses in Russia, and to make the workers more conscious of how they spoke, of uh, what their political responsibilities were, their role in the uh, elevation of society. And uh, on the other hand, the Stalinists, and one of the characteristics of Stalin's regime, was a marked decline in the cultural level of workers. I mean, the Stal any account of uh, the Kremlin's life under Stalin, the orgies of drinking, of gluttony, uh, this was very characteristic of a period of uh, intellectual and cultural decay in uh, what remained of the Bolshevik party. David, as we're speaking here today um, about the life and political biography of Leon Trotsky, and shortly we'll be talking about the assassination itself, I just want to uh, let you know and let all of our listeners know that we have um, listeners from around the world who are commenting uh, on this uh, discussion. New Zealand, Sydney, Detroit, South Korea, Bangalore, Turkey, San Francisco, Chicago, Minneapolis, Colombo, Florida, the United Kingdom, San Diego, Berlin, Romania, Illinois, Texas, New Orleans, and Kentucky. So it's quite an international audience that we have here. Uh, let's move on then to this issue of Trotsky's assassination. You've been making the argument that he represented um, a, a foe of Stalin of immense magnitude and that the danger always existed even though uh, he uh, was relatively isolated by the time of his death, you could argue in some ways, that he represented an enormous danger to, to Stalin still. Um, so can we speak just a little bit more about how Trotsky's assassination was prepared? I know that you uh, played a major role in this investigation into this question, security in the Fourth International. Forty years ago, the investigation um, put out a book called How the GPU Murdered Trotsky. Um, can you talk a little bit about what initiated that investigation and what the, some of the essential findings were of that investigation with regards to GPU infiltration of the Trotskyist movement? And by the GPU, I mean uh, Stalin's secret police. Well, actually, the, what triggered the investigation uh, was uh, an issue which had arisen in the Workers' League, the uh, predecessor of the Socialist Equality Party. In the summer of 1974, it emerged uh, that uh, 
our then national secretary, uh, Tim Wolfeth, uh, had entered into a personal relationship with a party member who, as it emerged, had close family connections with CIA personnel. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about this now, except to say that uh, Wolfeth was aware of this, and he did not inform the National Committee of our party of this situation. He didn't inform the International Committee of this issue, and even brought uh, his companion to a meeting of the International Committee in May of 1974, at which there were present uh, comrades working in countries such as Spain and Greece, which at that time had dictatorships. And uh, they had no idea that they were uh, in the presence of somebody whose family background uh, should have been known. Now, just to be very clear, people are not individually responsible for what their families do. And the issue was not whether this particular individual uh, was herself uh, an, an agent. The issue really was that when such relations exist in any serious political movement, it is the obligation of that individual to make those connections known so that they can be examined, clarified, and uh, uh, so that if it comes up in the future, there should be no suspicions or no questions raised as to concealment. When, and I just want to make the point, this discovery was made under conditions in the 1970s when it was well known that the FBI and the CIA and other intelligence services had engaged in massive uh, infiltration of left-wing groups. Uh, this was a period of the uh, COINTELPRO revelations. It was well known that penetration took place and that this posed a serious danger. At any rate, when we found out about this, the decision which was taken was to initiate an investigation of, the, of this background to get to the facts, what was the relationship, uh, was there any evidence that the individual uh, was herself uh, connected uh, to intelligence agencies. And so a commission of inquiry was established. And uh, this was done in collaboration between the Workers' League, which was a sympathizing section of the International Committee. At that time, the leading figure in the International Committee was Jerry Healy, who was also the General Secretary of the Workers' Revolutionary Party. Now, Wolfeth, after first accepting this proposal for a commission of inquiry, which was, by the way, there was a long tradition of such commissions in the socialist movement. He then resigned and uh, soon after re rejoined the Socialist Workers' Party, which he had opposed for some 14 years. In fact, he had initiated the founding of the Workers' League in opposition to the SWP. Anyway, the commission of inquiry went about its work it confirmed that, yes, this uh, person had uh, close family connections with high-level personnel in the CIA, including, and those connections included personal friendship of her family, with Richard Helms, who had been uh, the head of the CIA and uh, then later ambassador to uh, Iran. However, no evidence was found that this individual herself had any connections uh, to the CIA. And nevertheless, uh, Wolfworth left, and in our view, he had, through his behavior, totally disgraced himself, and no serious political movement would uh, support and endorse and condone the type of indifference that Wolfworth had shown to the security of his own organization. And I would make the point what we did at that time what would imagine would be done in any bourgeois party, what it would be done in, 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 in any bourgeois government. I mean, this, these issues come up. Why uh, 
there's no, no one has ever adequately explained why the workers' movement and the socialist movement, which has such a long history of persecution, should be indifferent to these issues. Now, the astonishing thing which happened and which led directly to the investigation was Joseph Hansen, who was the leader of the Socialist Workers' Party, wrote an extraordinary article based on Wolfworth's account of his resignation of the Workers' League. Hansen wrote an article in which he said that Healy's response to the issues related to Wolfworth's companion is paranoia. He said it's the workings of a mind best understood by a psychiatrist. Now this was, and I, when I look back on it after 40 years, living as we do in the age of the drone, in the age of massive state surveillance, it was extraordinary for such a statement to be made. All the more so because Joseph Hansen had been in Mexico in 1940 when Trotsky was assassinated. He was present. He witnessed Trotsky's assassination and Trotsky's death. He was there the day Ramon Mercader walked through the door. In fact, it was Hansen who rang him in. Mercader came in carrying an, um, uh, a raincoat in which he had concealed a alpenstock, an automatic weapon, and a dagger. No one stopped him. He was allowed to enter a room with Trotsky by himself, and there he used the alpenstock uh, to attack Trotsky and kill him. Now, not only did Hansen observe that, he knew, of course, that Trotsky's death was the outcome of the successful penetration of the Fourth International by an agent of the GPU. And he knew very well that Mercader's attack was the culmination of a long history of penetration by the Trotskyist movement, of the Trotskyist movement by agents of the GPU, and Trotsky was not the only victim. That there had been previous uh, penetrations, and he knew this from information which had first emerged, and of course this is to go somewhat ahead of our story, in the 1940s and 1950s, that there had been extensive penetration of the Trotskyist movement in Europe and also in the United States, which prepared the assassination and on the way to preparing the assassination had uh, been responsible for the death of a whole number of other leading figures in the Fourth International, including Trotsky's son, uh, Leon Sadov. And the most significant of these agents, apart from Mercader himself, had been uh, Marx Borofsky. I'll just make the point, recalling the initiation of the investigation, uh, Jerry Healy said to me that when he read Hansen's article, the first thing that occurred to him was Marx Borofsky. How could Hansen be so indifferent to questions of security, so indifferent to such an issue, given the role that Marx Borofsky had played in the Trotskyist movement in the 1930s? If you're just joining us, we're speaking here today with David North, uh, chairman of the International Editorial Board of the World Socialist Website. We're speaking about the life, political bi biography, and assassination of Leon Trotsky. David has just been discussing what uh, initiated um, the International Committee of the Fourth International's investigation in the 1970s into the circumstances surrounding Trotsky's murder and the opposition that this investigation provoked from layers, uh, other uh, left-wing parties in the United States and around the world who uh, accused the Workers' League at the time of, of, and the International Committee at the time of being paranoid over questions of security. Um, but David, as you've pointed out, uh, Trotsky's murder was actually preceded by a whole series of 
assassinations directed against uh, the left opposition. If I'm not mistaken, this included Ignaz Rice, who had defected from uh, Stalin's secret police. It also included Erwin Wolf, one of Trotsky's secretaries, uh, Trotsky's son, Leon Sadov, and um, finally Rudolf Clement, who was the secretary or was to be the secretary of the Fourth International in the process of being founded. Um, you've mentioned Mark Sporovsky as the agent who played a central role in the penetration of the Trotskyist movement and in uh, the preparation of these killings. Can you speak more about Zborovsky, how he was infiltrated into the Trotskyist movement, and the role he came to play um, in the assassinations? I will, but let me just uh, finish one thought about the origins of the investigation. When the International Committee met in 19... 75, in May 1975, and we discussed the response of Hansen and the SWP and the United Secretariat, for which he spoke, uh, to the basic security measures which were taken. It was decided that the best response to this really uh, libelous denunciation and deeply disorienting denunciation was to review the history. What had happened to the Fourth International in the 1930s, the terrible blows it suffered at the hands of the counter-revolution, to tell the story of the assassination of Leon Trotsky, such a, a monumental event in 20th century history. It could be described as the political assassination of the 20th century and certainly a traumatic event in the history of the Fourth International. And there was a, an enormous danger, I mean, when you consider for a moment the political irresponsibility of associating a legitimate concern, and certainly the events surrounding the security issues which arose in the Workers' League in 1974, it was entirely appropriate. We did nothing more than organize an, an internal investigation. It was irresponsible in the extreme, and. Uh, deeply disorienting and destructing of, destructive of the political education of Cater uh, to blackguard in that way elementary concern for security. So the International Committee at its meeting in May 1975 voted to initiate an investigation uh, into the history, into the background of Trotsky's assassination, and it was this investigation which for the first time produced a detailed and systematic account of the background of the Trotsky assassination. It is extraordinary when one considers the fact, given the significance of Trotsky's death, that except for a rather brief analysis which was produced by the SWP in 1941, which was important. The, the SWP set out immediately after Trotsky's assassination to establish as best it could that the killing of Trotsky was the work of the GPU. Of course, the assassin, Mercader, concealed his identity. He was known only as Frank Jackson. It wasn't until 1949 that it was decisively established that he was Ramon Mercader del Rio. But there was no examination at all of the background of the killing, the way in which the conspiracy was prepared and developed over a period of nearly a decade. And so security in the Fourth International was in fact the first investigation in 35 years into the assassination of Trotsky. And I must say that it remains to this day uh, among the, the most detailed, the most accurate uh, the most well-documented of any examination into Trotsky's assassination. Uh, I might add, we'll probably get to this somewhat later on, that many of its, the documents which it cites and uh, uncovered are now often referred to, though those who refer to them are very careful not to acknowledge that the source of their discovery was the International Committee. So, David, uh, let's focus a little bit then on um, what 
Security and the Fourth International established with regards to how Trotsky's assassination was prepared. Um, you mentioned Mark Zborowski. He was active um, in Paris. Um, and he, my understanding is he played a central role in the assassination of Leon Trotsky's son. Can you speak about <coughs> Sadov, Lev Sadov, his son, and uh, what happened, how he was killed, and the impact of that? Well, we know that Zborowski came from Poland. Uh, he infiltrated the Trotskyist movement in 1934 in Paris. Of course, Zborowski was not the first really significant agent before that. There were, and I raise them because their name will ap appear again and again later on. Uh, there were the brothers Sobolevicius. Uh, they were Lithuanians, uh, Ramon Sobolevicius and Avram Sobolevicius. They later became known in the United States as Jack Sobel and Robert Soblin. They infiltrated the Trotskyist movement in Germany and uh, they were known as Senin and Well. Uh, they actually met with Trotsky in 1931. Uh, their specific role was to create an atmosphere of factional intrigue inside the German left opposition, which was deeply destructive and uh, Given the fact that the left opposition was waging a struggle to shift the policies of the Communist Party, which were ultra-leftist, uh, blocking the Trotsky's fight for the uh, uh, unity of the Social Democratic and uh, Communist Party workers against Hitler, uh, Sobel and uh, the Sobel bro Sobel and brothers were Sobolevicius brothers were blocking that. They played a terribly destructive role. Ultimately, it became clear to Trotsky that they were agents. In fact, uh, in 1932, when Senin went to Copenhagen to see Trotsky, Trotsky had by this point become convinced that they were that Senin was an agent. He simply said to Senin, "You will one day regret what you are doing. I never want to see you again." Uh, years later, Senin was arrested in the United States as a, a spy, and his uh, brother was indicted in 1960 as a Soviet spy, and it is part of the subsequent story of security in the Fourth International, because a number of the people who were co-indicted, or named as unindicted co-conspirators, in the 1960 spy trial of uh, Sobin, 61 spy trial of Sobin, uh, also had functioned inside the Socialist Workers' Party as agents, and that included people who went down to Mexico, and included, uh, most infamously, uh, the personal secretary of James Buchanan, uh, Sylvia Callan. So, um, you've talked about the infiltration of um, Stalin's secret agents into the left opposition in Germany. So I should go on, and I'm sorry, because you raised so many questions, and of course a lot comes up. But you've asked me about Zborowski. So Zborowski penetrated the Trotskyist movement in 1934-35. Uh, and uh, he was, it appears, a master, uh, how can you say it, uh, imposter. Uh, from what I have heard, people I've spoken to who, who, who knew Zborowski, he was at once colorless, at least from the standpoint of being a political personality, but he had the ability to make himself, know how to make himself indispensable. He established a close relationship with Trotsky's son, Leon Sadov, who was living in Paris under extremely difficult circumstances, isolated, a lack of financial resources, a Russian emigre, uh, encircled by the GPU. But Zborowski was able to present himself as a solid and sympathetic supporter of course, it's tragic that he could do this, but clearly he did convince uh, Sadov uh, that he was a reliable person. He even had access to all of Sadov's personal and private papers. And uh, Sadov did not realize that this man was uh, systematically informing the GPU of 
every move that Leon Sadov made. There was another person in this picture as well, uh, a figure of considerable mystery, but whatever her ultimate identity, she played a reprehensible role in the history of the Fourth International, and a terribly destructive role in the history of the Fourth International, and that was a woman by the name of Lelia Ginsburg, uh, married name, her first married name was Lelia Estrine. She would later become known as Lola Dahlin. And uh, she became a close, I, it's hard to know what to describe them. I, uh, I mean, she was, she described herself and Zborowski as Siamese twins. Just to answer the question bluntly, I, I asked Jean Van Hagenert in an interview with him, he was Trotsky's uh, secretary. I asked Van Hagenert some 40 years ago, were they having an affair? And he said, no, 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 it was nothing like that. Which in a way makes the issue even more troubling because uh, Lelia Estrine, Lola, and I'll refer to her from now on as Lola Dahlin, proved to be absolutely essential in protecting Zborowski again and again against mounting suspicions within the movement in France that he was an agent. There were reasons why there were suspicions. First of all, there was the very colorlessness of his personality. He was not a man who seemed to have serious political opinions. Uh, to use the phrase that Van Hagenert used when he spoke to me in September 1970, he would say, always swimming, always swimming, in his references to Zborowski. Always swimming, always swimming, by which he meant that he seemed to be able to adapt himself to any situation, never revealing very much of himself, making himself indispensable, always being the man on the spot. Now, in, 19, in November 1936, Trotsky's archive, an important section of Trotsky's archives which have been deposited in Paris at the Nikolaevsky Institute. And Nikolaevsky was a well-known Menshevik, emerged as sort of a figure, custodian of social democratic history. Uh, a significant portion of Trotsky's archive was deposited at the Institute. Very few people knew of its whereabouts. The only people who knew were Sidov, uh, Zborowski, and Lola Dahlin. But in November, on the uh, 19th anniversary of the Russian Revolution, the GPU, organized a break-in which was extremely well prepared, very sophisticated technically. And uh, Zborowski apparently, while he had provided the GPU with the information where the archive was, he was himself somewhat upset because he knew there were so few people who knew of the whereabouts that it would raise suspicions about him. He had done one thing, however, which was clever. He had kept a portion of the archive in his own residence, so, and that was not touched. So he could say, well, the archive that is with me is safe. Somehow the GPU managed to discover uh, where the archive was, but cover his own responsibility. Um, but there were those who had doubts uh, about uh, Zborowski. And these were, in fact, intensified when in the aftermath of the defection of Ignaz Rice. Ignaz Rice uh, was a member of the Soviet GPU. Uh, he defected, he denounced Stalin, and declared his intention to join the Fourth International. Tragically, he did not make this declaration public. He wanted to first send a letter to the Soviet Central Committee returning. I think he had the order of Lenin. He wanted to first make this private declaration. Uh, it was badly handled. Uh, Zborowski knew of Ignaz Rice's whereabouts, and with the assistance of uh, uh, Zborowski, uh, they were tipped off when Ignaz Rice was making uh, a trip to Switzerland, and Ignaz Rice was. Uh, cornered somewhere outside Lausanne in September 1937 and shot to death. Uh, 
a significant figure. He was not precisely a Trotskyist, but he was a, a sympathetic to Trotsky's views. There were political differences with him. That is Hank Snevelit, who was a, a, a Dutch revolutionist of long standing. He had been in the Communist International. He said directly, there is an agent in the Fourth International, and it's Zborowski, Etienne. I mean, I should have mentioned Zborowski used the name Etienne at the time. He said, the agent is Etienne. Uh, Pierre Naville believed that uh, Zborowski, that Etienne was an agent. Finally, uh, in, uh, and there was one other assassination I should mention. You referred to the assassination of Erwin Wolf. Erwin Wolf was an important secretary of Trotsky. Uh, he had provided a great deal of assistance for Trotsky, by the way, when Trotsky was in Norway, he was a uh, German background. He went to Spain in uh, 1937, Zbrowski tipped off the GPU, and uh, Wolf was almost immediately arrested, tortured. It's not known whether he was sent to the Soviet Union, but he was certainly murdered by the GPU. Uh, with the assistance of uh, Dahlin, Estrine Dahlin, who was continuously vouching for uh, the bona fides of uh, Etienne, and who was continuously writing letters to uh, uh, Trotsky and Natalia, his wife in Mexico, presenting themselves as his most devoted followers, and doing everything they could to blacken the reputation of those who opposed them, even uh, Victor Serge, and uh, I must say that Victor Serge uh, was of the opinion that uh, Lola Dahlin was an agent. <clears throat> there were others who believed the same. At any rate, uh, the tragedy continued. In February 1938, Leon Sadov took ill. Uh, we had uh, stomach cramps. He was uh, 31 years old, not quite 32. He was taken to a hospital, the clinic Mirabeau. The hospital was selected by Lola Dahlin. It was a very, very reckless choice, to say the least. It was a hospital known to be uh, heavily infiltrated by or populated by white Russians, that is, anti-Bolshevik Russians. It was also an area under the constant surveillance of the GPU. At any rate, uh, Sedov was taken to that hospital. Zbrovsky informed the GPU of uh, the movement of Sedov to that hospital. There was an operation. The operation appeared to have been successful. However, several days later, after what had appeared to be a routine recovery, Sedov suddenly again took violently ill and died. It has never been exactly established how he died or what was the cause of his death. Uh, the autopsy was not entirely clear on this, but the documents left behind suggest either uh, a peritonitis induced by medical, deliberate medical malpractice murder. There is also the possibility of poisoning, which was raised by Trotsky. The French police refused to conduct a serious investigation. But if one puts you know, two and two together, the GPU knew where Leon Sedev was. They had been informed by uh, Etienne. They were able to get to him. Uh, how he was killed, again, it remains something of a question. Uh, who exactly did it? There is some evidence which may suggest that uh, it was uh, a doctor working with the GPU who deliberately made a cut into Sedov's intestine, inducing the peritonitis. There's even a uh, suspicion that uh, he may have been given poison, and one of those on whom suspicion falls is Lola Dahlin. But at any rate, the uh, <coughs> Trotsky uh, Sedov died. It was a horrifying uh, loss for the Fourth International. Zbrowski sent a very touching letter of condolence uh, to uh, Natalia, <clears throat> as did, uh, in fact, it was a letter sent by uh, Lola Dahlin, and uh, to which uh, Zbrowski sent his own appendix, or affixed uh, his own appendix. Afterwards, uh, 
there was yet another murder, uh, and that was that of the secretary of the Fourth International, Rudolf Clement, another German emigre. He was, um, it is believed, engaged in an investigation of the circumstances of Sidov's death, and he may have had documents related to Zborovsky. The documents were stolen. Uh, Clement was kidnapped from his apartment in July of 1938. His uh, trunk, his torso, without arms, legs, and head, were f was fished out of the Seine uh, several weeks later, um, murdered by the GPU. He was, of course, another victim of uh, Mark Sporovsky, Etienne. So this agent, Mark Sporovsky, um bore responsibility or was in some way connected to at least four assassinations of those inside the Fourth International or affiliated with it somehow. Um, I'd like to continue speaking, perhaps we'll get to this next week, about the infiltration of the Trotskyist movement. But just on the question of Zborowski, my understanding is that at some point he comes to the United States and is actually, after several years, able to launch a successful academic career for himself. He becomes an anthropologist. And my understanding is that, uh, as part of the investigation, you, you met him, is that correct? You, you had an encounter with him. I would call it an encounter. I didn't meet him in uh, 1975. In, 19, in August 1975, I uh, found out where he was living. I must say, it was not hard to find out where he was living. He was even in the phone book. He was working at the Mount Zion Medical Center. He had previously worked at Harvard. He had, of course, gone to jail, not for murder, but for perjury. He lied about when he was confronted with Jack Sobel, the old former Senate. He denied having known him. That perjury ultimately resulted in his conviction. So I um, found out where he was working, in uh, living in uh, August of 1975 and uh, I had a camera and when he uh, apparently he had been out shopping with his wife and he pulled up in his Honda and got out uh, with his grocery bags or got, I walked across the street and I took his photo and uh, he swung a punch and uh, I took a number of pictures and uh, his wife uh, turned to me and said you can do nothing with those photos if you know what's good for you and she said that because they clearly enjoyed a great deal of protection from the state. After all, given his political history, his criminal history, it is extraordinary that this man was able to nevertheless have a very uh, successful career. You mentioned his arrival in the United States. Uh, I should point out again that he owed that rescue from Europe. He was brought to the United States in 1941. He owed that once again to Lola Dahlin. She, as in so many different occasions, uh, took went to extraordinary lengths to protect Zborowski, bringing him, she forged, uh, helped him, uh, she produced a basically a fraudulent affidavit, um, arranged the financing, and the transport of Zborowski into the United States. She was working, by the way, in that particular operation with George Novak, uh, leader of the SWP. This was a fact which was kept secret for 35 years. Uh, but uh, she, he was, she was, he was brought back into the United States, uh, even though by that time, and this might be something we'll discuss next week, the fact that he had been identified as an agent was very well known inside the leadership of the Trotskyist movement. It was known within the Socialist Workers' Party that he had been identified as a GPU agent uh, by none other than General Orlov. They didn't know exactly who the ad Orlov was, but there had been a direct warning delivered to Trotsky uh, that there was an agent by the name of Mark close to his son who uh, was working for the GPU. And it was, of course, uh, Lola Dahlin, I might add again, who, when she learned of this warning, did her best to persuade Trotsky to ignore it, that uh, Mark was simply a, uh, uh, the victim of a GPU provocation.
So, David, we're um, coming to the end of our time here today, and we'll be continuing this discussion next week. Um, you've been telling a very compelling story of the infiltration of the Trotskyist movement by agents of Stalin's secret police. And next week, uh, we'll move on to um, a discussion of how precisely Trotsky's assassination was prepared, the impact of that event, and then even after his death, the continued infiltration of the Trotskyist movement by um, agents of different states' secret services. Um, I'd like to just refer readers to who are following this discussion, or listeners, to uh, the featured essay that David North published on the World Socialist website on September 30th, uh, marking the 75th anniversary of Trotsky's assassination, in which he reviews this history in some detail. Um, I would also like to underscore that the World Socialist website is sustained entirely through listener and reader support, and we urge you to make a donation today to help sustain this work. You can also find copies of David's works on Trotsky and on questions of history and politics at the publisher Maring Books. You can also find a copy of the book How the GPU Murdered Trotsky. David, is there anything that you would like to say in conclusion uh, to today's interview? Well, I mean, I, I, again, this is a very vast area of history. The, uh, just as Trotsky's life and works retain immense relevance, I think it just has to be understood that the questions which are raised by his death are of extraordinary significance. I know we'll get into this in greater detail next week, but perhaps as an introduction to that upcoming discussion, it must be said that when the International Committee began this investigation and began to publish documents relating to the infiltration of the Trotskyist movement, it came under absolutely ferocious attack by all the Pabloid organizations. I will point out that it soon became clear as our investigation developed that the Socialist Workers' Party, and in particular Joseph Hansen, had done everything they could to cover up the extent of GPU penetration of the Trotskyist movement. Not to leave our listeners in suspense, the reasons for this were to emerge in the course of that investigation because we were to establish that Joseph Hansen himself was a GPU agent. Of that there is absolutely no question. And there are the documents which establish that. He was part, in 1938, uh, there were an intensification of the preparations of infiltration that involved placing Sylvia Caldwell or Sylvia Franklin uh, in the uh, national headquarters of the SWP. That was an operation carried out by Budens working with a Soviet intelligence operative by the name of Rabinovitz, known as John. It was the same Budens Rabinovitz team which introduced Sylvia Agaloff, a member of the SWP, to Ruby Weil. Ruby Weil was recruited by Budens and Rabinovitz to introduce Sylvia uh, Agaloff to Ramon Mercader. And in 1938, Budens and Rabinovitz met Joseph Hansen and recruited him into the operation as well. Now, the, when this investigation was launched, and we had, it took some time, and I'm just giving an, in, an in, in indication of what is to come, but we came under tremendous attack for uncovering these facts, uncovering the uh, degree of infiltration which had been ignored and suppressed. And a meeting was held in 1977 on January 14th, which we call the Platform of Shame, in which uh, the investigation was denounced, and specifically, the uh, it was called to defend the reputation of people who had been unjust, unjustly slandered by the International Committee and by the uh, Securing the Fourth International Investigation, those they defended explicitly were Sylvia Franklin, 
whom they at that point declared was an exemplary comrade. They defended Robert Sheldon Hart explicitly. Both those individuals have in the meantime been exposed decisively as GPU agents by the Venona Papers and of course by the documents which were uncovered by the International Committee uh, some 30 years ago in the course of the Gelfand case. And uh, they of course uh, defended Lola Dahlin uh, against whom there exists overwhelming circumstantial evidence that she was an accomplice of Zborowski. It is difficult to believe that she did not know what Zborowski was doing and her defense and cover-up of Zborowski uh, spans some 20 years. At any rate, these are issues we will discuss. They're of immense significance and uh, our belief is that after 40 years after the launching of this investigation, this history must be studied and understood and it's of immense significance in the education of a new generation of people coming to socialism. Thank you, David, for um, participating in today's discussion on the 75th anniversary of Trotsky's assassination. Uh, I'd like to also thank all of our listeners out there for uh, being with us today and to encourage you to join us next week at the same time where we will be continuing our discussion of the assassination of Leon Trotsky and the infiltration of the Trotskyist movement. Thank you very much.